Um, before we start our program and we start live streaming and filming for that, I've got a few commercials to do before I do. Uh, first, one reminder, next Tuesday at 6 p.m. we will be hosting yet another program here at our library. Um, and it's the last of our Pushing the Limits series. The theme for the last program is knowledge. Um, this program is funded through a grant through the National Science Foundation and World Gateways, focusing on how science, technology, engineering, and math are integral parts of our everyday life. The program format is a series of TED Talks and podcasts and discussions. It's free, it's open to the public. Um, please come and join us for that. Another note, um, at the end of tonight's um, program, once you fill out your surveys, we really want to hear what you have to say. Um, you, I'm going to have a big basket. You can put the surveys and the entry forms that you may have found on your, your chairs into that basket. Um, we're doing um, a drawing tonight for an Amazon gift card. So um, good luck and, and we'll win. And so hopefully it, somebody will win. Is it contingent that you fill this out? Yes, yes, yes it is. Yes it is. I, I, I use every method I can, you know. <laughs> so, um, and one final note about tonight. Um, if possible, Try not to go down the center aisle as we're, as we're going through the program tonight. Um, with our cameras, um, we're going to pick up a lot of uh, interruption, darkness. So um, if you can use the side aisles, we really, really appreciate that. Which is, I know, we're, we're jammed in here. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Stephanie Kraft from the University of Illinois um, Media. You want to come on? <laughs> oh, look, I'm doing exactly what you said. I know. To do. I know. I'm, I'm not following <laughs> instructions. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> Well, hi, everyone. Glad to see a full room. Um, I am Stephanie Kraft, University of Illinois, and I teach in the College of Media. Specifically, I teach in the journalism department there. I teach things like journalism history, journalism ethics. I teach some communication theory. And I have taught some classes in what we call news literacy, which is, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, it's kind of a branch, so to speak, or like a subcategory kind of of media literacy. So it's um, especially a, a lot of people talking about news literacy these days for some obvious reasons that I'm sure we can all share and we'll share about. Um, so what I want to talk about today is kind of where some of those news literacy, fake news, ethical issues, responsibilities of news consumers as well as journalists all kind of mesh together. Um, so let's see if my little clicker thing works. I don't know really where I'm pointing it. Am I pointing it there? Oh, it makes a ding, that's nice, but it's not moving. Hmm. Well, I'm just going to talk for a moment. The next slide is really funny, so let's just prepare ourselves for that if it goes there. Or maybe, ah, see, as promised. I think this probably reflects how a lot of us might feel right about now, that I really try hard <laughs> to be an informed consumer, but how do I do that and yet still keep all of my hair, not pull it all out of my head? Um, so, right, we're going to be thinking about why is it that way? Why is it so hard to be well informed and maintain some semblance of like normal uh, levels of sanity? Okay, am I not doing this right? Yeah, no, it's not you, it's, it's our equipment. Let me know when you want me to advance. Oh, you poor thing. That's okay. You okay. Know, it's going to be a lot of advancing. That's fine. You might need a chair. I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go to the, let's go past the, yeah. Okay. So here are questions to ponder specifically um, around fake news, right? So is fake news new? I think you're going to probably guess that the answer to that is no, but don't want to give too much away <coughs> yet. How is fake news fake? 
And by what I mean, what I mean there is, what is it about fake news that makes it seem like this own, its own separate category of thing? Okay, especially if it isn't new, which we'll find out in a moment. Why? This kind of refers to the title of the talk. Why is fake news so alluring? Right? Like, why do people get kind of swept up in it? Why does it seem to have kind of taken over uh, a little bit? Whose problem is fake news, and what can we do about it? Okay, so those are sort of our guiding questions here. I, I think I'm going to address all of them, and if I don't, I'm going to count on you to tell me where I messed up. Okay, next one. All right, so fakery then and now. Now, it might be a little hard to see this, but that is a picture of a fairly famous fire in London in the 19th century, <laughs> okay? And there's a little snippet of a quote there from the correspondent who wrote about that fire for a newspaper in Berlin. Obviously, it's translated from the German. Those of you in the room who might speak some German can tell me, hold, don't tell me yet, can tell me what that top line means. But let's look and see what the, what the correspondent has said about this fire. I went to the scene today, and it's a terrible sight. One sees the burned buildings, you know, like, oh, it's so terrible, and this is an artist rendering of it. Does anybody in here speak German? You never know. <laughs> um, what that means at the top is essentially the fake correspondent. In the 19th century, it was pretty common, actually, for especially foreign correspondents to be kind of making up their stories. Okay? So let's think about it. We're going to talk about him, the fake correspondent, more. Okay, but let's just ponder for a second what that means. This guy writes for a Berlin newspaper, is writing about a fire in London, is saying that he went there, and this is a person who never crossed the English Channel once in his life. He's never been to London, much less to cover that fire. So how did he do it? Why did he do it? Well, it's not like the fire didn't happen, so it's not fake like that. Okay, it's not like it wasn't destructive in that way. Right? But what he did was he sort of looked at all the coverage of people who had seen the fire. He picked the best parts, right? and then he embellished and created characters and created like someone who took him to the scene of the fire, sort of escorted him there. So he makes up some quotes and stuff like that. So is that story fake or not? Right? I mean, the story, the actual incident, not fake. What he reported about it, not fake. Some of the parts of it, definitely fake. Right? So, but no one seemed to care in the 19th century for some reason. Right? This was a, not a, an unusual practice of just this one uh, newspaper. Okay, next one. Then we've got, go ahead. The modern day example is the guy who I'm calling the broke consultant wannabe who created this story that some of you might remember, and I, I, again, the, the resolution isn't great here. That is an image of a guy standing by some things that are labeled ballot boxes. Now, some of you may remember during the, the 2016 campaign, there was this kind of brief controversy about this news story that said tens of thousands of fraudulent Clinton votes found in Ohio warehouse, and this was the picture. Did anybody see this? Yeah. You guys, you remember this from the election? You remember it too. Okay, so yeah, at least we know it's not fake that I've made it up. It really <coughs> was a real fake news, see? It gets confusing. So, this appeared on a site inexplicably, well, we will explain it in a minute, called the Christian Times. Now, where does the broke consultant wannabe come in? Well, the guy who created this story, which by the way, 100% fake, okay, was a 23-year-old guy, I'm going to guess some of you can sympathize with this next part, trying to pay off his student loans and wanted to make money, right? And so he's thinking to himself, well, I can buy a domain. He buys the Christian Times one. It had been sort of created by someone, not used anymore, right? He buys it for $5, okay? And then he decides, well, this is going to be my platform to create news and make a lot of money off the advertising that I can put on the site, okay? And so in order to make enough money off the advertising, he's got to have something that people will want to click on and see. So he thinks to himself, well, what's going on? What's the narrative going on in the election at this point? Well, candidate, now President Trump, was saying a lot about a rigged election, right? He was really 
concerned, telling his supporters he thought the election was going to be rigged, that there's no way that Clinton would win unless it was rigged, and on and on. I'm guessing you all remember that too. And so this guy who's broke, who wants to be a consultant, who just is kind of in this for the quick money, says, you know what, I bet I could create a story around that, right? So we have a 19th century example where someone has taken a real thing, embellished it, and passed it off as news. And we've got a similar, not exactly the same, but a similar modern day example of someone who recognizes kind of a story, like it's not fake that Trump had made that an issue, right? It's not fake that people were talking about it, right? And sort of capitalizes on something that's just sort of in the air, right? And makes a lot of money. Now somebody sort of tracked him down and figured this out and then he was like, whoa, I didn't mean for it to be all political. But he made like $5,000 just like that, doing that, okay? so. Ideas for home businesses. There you go. <laughs> All right, next one. So let's compare how this worked, right? And I am indebted, by the way, to a, this German studies scholar at Dartmouth who like, kind of told the world about these 19th century fakers. Here's what she says about die unechte Korrespondenz. That's my German accent. His readers probably believed him because his story confirmed a lot of things they already knew. Right, so his story didn't feel fake because it resonated somehow with what they'd already read about the fire in London, huge fire, very terrible. Similarly, that ballot story, that ballot box story, this is a quote from the guy who created it. Trump was saying, rigged election, rigged election. People were predisposed to believe Hillary Clinton could not win except by cheating. So again, he's successful to the extent that he's tapping into something that people are already talking about and already sort of think could be true, right? Interesting similarity. So the answer kind of to our first question is fake news not really new, right? And there's some interesting stuff about how it works that we can trace all the way back to the 19th century. Okay, next. Here is an image of a paper, an American paper from the 19th century. This happened to be one of the yellow papers, okay? Look at this front page. Is this fake news? Does it look like fake news? Right? It looks quite sensational, doesn't it? Right? That was the whole thing about the yellow papers, is that they really dramatized life. Okay? So here we have you know, this woman jumping from the Brooklyn Bridge. We have a kind of an artist rendering of her jumping. Right? We've got kind of a portrait of her and why she did, oh, her money was gone. You know, she, right? We've got these really big headlines, right? all of this stuff. This stuff is all true, right? But it has this kind of appealing quality that we want to keep in mind, like about modern day examples of things that make fake news sort of appealing, alluring, okay? So here's our old thing. This, is, this isn't this kind of aspect, the dramatic appearance aspect is not new. Okay, next one. And then you have this. Mm -hmm. We've seen this at the supermarket for a long time, right? And no one minds. <laughs> Some of us mind, not all of us think about it too much. Okay, now, in case, you know, just to be clear, 100% fake. Okay, just let's all be on the same page here. But think about it, people sort of look at this and they get it. They get that it's like so over the top. Of course it's supposed to be fake, right? Isn't it? Nod with me, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So again, the idea of something that's just outright made up, this is not new, right? And so we are still left with this question, right? What is new then about this fake news that we saw so much of during the campaign and really even before that, but really during the campaign? What is new about it? Okay. So, we're going to talk about four, oh, no, okay, four things that sort of make fake news hard to figure out. I say tricky to tackle here. Hard to figure out. Okay? And the first one, let's just pause for a moment. It challenged, okay, it's, this seems so weird and counterintuitive, but just bear with me. I don't know why I'm holding this if it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's fake news. It's like I'm <laughs> pretending to have autonomy. Okay. 
um, it challenges this either or idea. It challenges the idea that something is either true or false. Now think about those historical examples. There were parts of those things that had a little bit of truth to them, right? And so there's something about fake news that you can't just say it's 100% false because that doesn't really tell you the whole story. And as I point out here, something can start out as a completely satirical kind of weekly world news, I have Bigfoot's baby, whatever thing, and then sort of morph, kind of get laundered into a fake news thing that's sort of meant to look like it's not a joke, right? And so we can't, it's tricky to sort of nail fake news, net, fake news down because it isn't just true or false. If it were that easy, we wouldn't be here, right? We wouldn't be here talking about it. It wouldn't really be worth talking about, okay? And so the example here is maybe you uh, recently, uh, the press secretary got into a little bit of trouble here with some comments that he made about the Holocaust. This, however, was not one of the comments he made about the Holocaust, okay? This represents, that headline represents, a far more extreme thing that he could have said about the Holocaust, but did not, okay? So there were issues raised about how he characterized the use of gas during on you know, German citizens during the Holocaust, right? So there's something truthful here, right? There's enough of the kind of surface truthiness to it that then it would be sort of, you can see where maybe initially someone might look at this and sort of be like, oh, really? Like I heard something about Spicer saying something about the Holocaust. Is that what he said? Right, so we can't just say it's true or false because it is true that Spicer said some things about the Holocaust that were like kind of out there, right? But it, he wasn't that far out there, okay? So that's kind of our number one true, false, either or, not that black and white. Okay, here's our satirical onion. My favorite one here is nothing would surprise me at this point, says man shocked by everything. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> Nothing can surprise me anymore. And then I read it, I'm like, oh my god, you know, what now, right? This, maybe some of you who've lived in older homes can appreciate the radiator <laughs> saving loudest clank for middle of the night. Okay, so these things can start out satirical. Now, these aren't great examples of things that could morph into a fake news piece, but that is instructive too, right? The Spicer thing works because it really is already in the news somehow. Right? And then you could see where it could start out as satire and then sort of bloom into something else. These other kind of satirical things, it would be uh, maybe a little bit harder uh, to do, but it's fun to show the onion anyway. Okay. So these people at, a, at an organization called First Draft have attempted, okay, and this is going to be hard to read, have attempted to kind of categorize all the things that people are calling fake news. Now, okay. This alone should tell you that it's not an either or thing. It's not either like, oh, it's fake news, it's not fake news. Because look at all the varieties of it. People have called stuff fake news, have labeled it fake news if it was satire, like the onion. Or if it was just sort of misleading, but maybe the facts in it weren't exactly wrong, right? Or maybe it's genuine sources are sort of impersonated. That's the imposter part. Like you might have a situation where there are real people kind of getting misrepresented or put in a different context or something. Then there's outright fabrication, just making stuff up, right? Well, those are four of the seven types. Like, my goodness, how, like if, if there are seven types of things that get called fake news, we're really in trouble trying to figure this out. And then on the bottom, we have things where you could look at a piece and you could look at the headline or the picture or something and think, oh my gosh, you know, and click on it, and then you go to the story and it's like, wait, what does this have to do with the headline, right? So that false connection, you're sort of getting drawn in thinking that the story or the picture is going to tell you one thing, and then you get something else. People have labeled that fake news too. That might not be how you're defining fake news, but that is how others have, have done that. Putting things in a false context, okay, and then manipulating content. So we could sit here for the rest of the time and actually just come up with examples of all of these things. And some of the other examples that we're, we're going to look at, we could um, try to kind of put in the right box. The point at this moment 
is just to say, wow, seven types of misleading content, right? Again, fake news, it really challenges us to think beyond either it's fake or it's not. It, my, how is it fake? It might be fake in entirely different ways. One item might be fake in that way. One item might be sort of fake in this other way. One item might look fake but not be fake, right? All kinds of stuff. Okay. Let me get my water. Ready for the next one? Yeah. Okay. Here's number two. Fake news is tricky because it challenges, okay, so this is maybe too professory talk, but it challenges the distinction between content and circulation. What do I mean by that? <coughs> well, the non-professor way of saying that is if we're going to determine whether something's fake news and then maybe figure out how to address it, we have to not just think about it as here's a thing, can I fact check it or not? Instead, we have to think about how did that thing circulate and why, right? There's something about fake news, like especially what we saw in the previous slide in terms of context, taking true things and putting them in a false context can make them fake or seem fake, right? So if we want to get our arms around this fake news idea, we can't just be thinking about content because there's, no, there's a way in which you can't separate the content from how it got distributed to people, okay? Here's one example. So this is um, a piece addressing, you know, liberals attacking Christmas and Trump's response, okay? And I point this out to you, um, just <coughs> click the thing again. What's going to be hard to see is that the source of this site right here is something called conservativepost.com. It's helpful, isn't it, to know that a conservative identified site is the one circulating this piece. That's going to help us make a determination, isn't it, about the purposes of distribution, if nothing else. Okay? So this is a story that had some elements of things that were true in it, some elements of things that were totally made up. But you understand that better if you kind of know where the, the purveyor of it, so to speak, is coming from. Okay, so that's a way in which we want to think about not just the content all by itself, like in a vacuum, like we're going to study it like scientists or something, but think about it as inseparable, really, from how it gets out there and circulated among people. Okay. Now, I do not expect anyone to read this. This is really <coughs> more for, to make you laugh. Here's, here's another reason what? Here's another reason not to be a professor. No, I'm just kidding. Here is another way to sort of show you evaluating, like looking at something and saying, that I believe. I think it's accurate. I think it's authentic. I believe it. It is credible. Okay, this happens to be um, something from the information science kind of research people, right? And this is how, this is a model for how people judge the credibility of online information. Now, this is from several years ago, um, so it doesn't really address social media yet. But the point, again, is just big picture here. There are things about the surface characteristics that matter in people deciding whether to believe something or not. Does the video load? I don't know about you, but like if a site, if like the video doesn't load, I'm done. I'm like, I'm just gone. Like I'll click on it, I will wait. One, two, okay, I'm gone. Right? I'm impatient. <laughs> okay, I guess. Or is it like junky looking? Can I find, you know, like if not, I'm gone. Right? But think about it. Like that has nothing really to do with the credibility of it, except that researchers have demonstrated how people actually use that as part of the way that they evaluate the credibility of something. Then you've got all the stuff related to the source of the message, whoever people perceive the source to be, right? Now, this is going to be tricky when it comes to something like Facebook, right? Everybody in here on Facebook or many of you? Who's on Facebook? A lot of you, okay. So, I don't know about you, but when someone shares something with me on Facebook, oh, that's nice. Look, they've shared that with me, right? Now, most of my Facebook friends are actually friends <laughs> and not just random people. I know that some people just like kind of accumulate friends because it can be kind of interesting. But I might already 
be positively sort of predisposed simply because I like the person who shared it with me, right? That's a judgment I'm making before I even see where the thing came from, right? I could have a really good, nice friend who shared something completely fake with me, but my initial reaction might be to believe it because of who shared it with me. Is that person the source? Or is the site where that thing that I have to click on, is that the source? Or is there someone in the story who's the source? Like, there are so many things that could be the source of the information that I am making some sort of judgment about. It's really hard, right? And so I just love that this is like, models are meant to like, simplify processes and look at this you know what i mean like look at all the things that are going into people making up their minds about whether to believe something online or not things about the technology things about the source things about the message itself right all these questions about like am i finding out what i need to know like what am i all right tons of stuff going on so again hard to kind of separate the message from the way the message is brought to you okay This also tells you something about, again, the personal sort of lens, so to speak, that you might be looking through, you know, when you're kind of looking at stuff shared on Facebook or when you're looking at news sites uh, and so on. So this, again, was during, you know, based on the election. And on the left are some uh, fake news stories that you might be kind of familiar with. The top one is the kind of famous one, one of the famous ones from the election about Pope Francis endorsing Donald Trump which did not happen. <coughs> but look at the difference between Trump and Clinton voters and who believed that headline, at least initially, right? So we have to kind of accept the fact that, you know, we're all, regardless of where we are in the political spectrum, right, we're all kind of looking at information, at least initially, through a particular kind of lens that's shaped by our political leanings and our education and our experiences and the mood that we're in that day and all kinds of things, okay? So <coughs> you can see that the Clinton voters are sort of less likely, but not that's not zero, right, is it? <laughs> right? But they're less likely than Trump voters to believe that Pope Francis endorsed Trump. Look, same thing here. Most, I mean, almost all, right, Trump voters thought that uh, Donald Trump had done this great thing, picking up these strand of Marines, okay? But look, this isn't, you know, like the Clinton supporters were like, oh, okay, that could happen, right? But the, you know, so there's one thing here. There's the differences, which are consistent, but there's also the idea that even the Clinton voters, even with that lens, right, um, are sort of willing to kind of suspend, you know, disbelief a little bit in this political environment where like, I have to say, uh, from my own perspective, it really did kind of seem like anything was possible on any given day, you know, like, oh, that could be possible, sure. Why not, Pope Francis, why not? Okay, so again, we've had our first thing where fake news isn't really either or. Now our second thing, which says, hmm, how did it get circulated? By whom did it get circulated? What were all the other kinds of features of it? You know, the site that I saw it on, was my computer running that day? Like all of those things factor into um, figuring out what's fake and what's not fake. Okay. Here's the third one. I'm just calling this follow the money. So we mentioned that the ballot box fake story guy got into it to make money, right? So there must be money to be made in fake news. We can't really understand fake news until we understand how it's funded, okay? Now, what you're seeing here is just sort of a, a chunk of, um, I'm, I, if I remember right, this is from BuzzFeed, okay? Some of you might read BuzzFeed. And this is a real ad for a real retailer, The Gap, or is it just Gap? Maybe it's wrong to say The Gap. It's just Gap. Anyway, so here's a real ad for Gap or The Gap, your choice, right? Alongside other sorts of advertising kind of oriented things that two of which are fake stories. This is a Kim Kardashian story that's not fake. Here's a Pope story that is fake. And here's a transgender restroom story that is also fake. Okay. BuzzFeed was sort of surprised to discover that things, you know, they sort of sell this, they, they don't sell it, they 
have these brokers, these ad networks that are placing ads on their site that A, can look like news, right, and not really be news, BuzzFeed sort of knew that, but what they found sort of fascinating on their own was that how much of that was fake, not just sort of clickbaity, okay, but that would also s exist kind of alongside a regular ad, right? So the point here is, okay, f super confusing, all right, but there's also money to be made. It'll be more clear on the next slide, I think. So this is a screenshot of ads from a fake news site called Rev Content. Any Rev Content fans? Okay. Now, yes, these are ads from what is acknowledged to be a fake news site. But how many of you have seen this kind of a box on regular what you consider to be legitimate? Right, they're on legitimate news sites too. This is um, one of the areas that post-election kind of fake news panic, people have started to address and say, wait a minute, why do we allow misleading stuff to appear on our sites which we want to be seen as legitimate, okay? And so I have often wondered too, like I'll go to some sites, which again, I feel like, you know, that's some good journalism on there. And then you look at the ads, you look at these things and you're like, what is that, right? It looks like a story, right? But it's actually an ad and it's super misleading because um, there's a picture of Ivanka over something about homeowners getting money back. Like, does she have something to do with that? Like, I, really? I mean, I'm imagining if I click on that, like, Ivanka will disappear and have nothing to do with, it. well, I don't know, maybe she's just handing out money to homeowners. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't look into it, okay? I'll let you guys do that, right? So we've got these confusing things that are made to look like news that sometimes appear on legitimate news sites but are actually ads. This happened to be on, on a fake news site, okay? The thing to think about there is that if this is appearing on a fake news site and almost exactly the same thing is appearing on a site you trust, hmm, where's the support for fake news coming from, <laughs> right? What, what does that mean for all of us? Are so you we're... You click on these and you see an ad? When you click on them, you kind of get taken to a thing that sort of looks like a story, but then pretty quickly is like essentially a press release for okay. something. Yeah. It looks like when you screenshot that, you were about to go to Ivanka's site because it's highlighted. It is highlighted. I know. I, I didn't. I wish I had because I would like to know how to get $4,264 back. I, I would like that a lot. But I got, I don't know, the mystery, mystery will continue. Okay, next. So let's think about these ad networks then. What this means is that legitimate and what I will say for the moment are illegitimate <laughs> news sites, they're using the same ad networks, okay? They're using like Google Sense, some of you might have heard of, right? There's a Google Analytics thing, but Google's really big. They're like, you can kind of contract with them and they'll just like throw ads on your site and it's all based on kind of clicks and stuff like that. Now look at people who are evaluating different sites for you know, where to place ads. Look at what they're saying here. Ad networks aren't really looking for quality. You know, when Google Sense or whatever is looking for a place to stick ads that people have contracted with them to place, right? They're not looking for quality, they just wanna know the minimum threshold. If it's not porn, then you're pretty good. Good to go. They don't care if it's fake or not, right? This guy who actually runs fake news sites, this guy kind of works for all different kinds of publishers, right? This guy who actually works for fake news sites, look what he says. Ad networks, they don't care about the content as long as the traffic comes from real people, okay? So we have a problem here, don't we, where the same kind of financial support goes to real news and fake news, right? And I don't know, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say it costs a whole lot more money to gather real news than it does to make up fake news in your bathrobe, right? And so you're getting the same money though. It's all about how many people go to the site, who's clicking, right? How many people visit the site, how many people click on the stuff. So we'll get, I think in a little bit, we're gonna get more into that problem, but just think about that. We can't really get a whole handle on fake news until we figure out like 
how it gets so flush for funds. Well, it gets it the same way that more resource intensive real news gets it, right, from these ad networks. Okay. And then our last of the four things that make fake news tricky, right? The people who purvey, like provide you with the fact news, and then the people who try to fact check that fact news, they are reaching different people, right? So everyone who looked at that ballot box story and believed it, chances are pretty good they never saw the fact checking story about that, right? This funky little thing <laughs> here is from a study um, all about fake news, actually, where they're trying to kind of get a handle, again, on things about, um, you know, uh, traffic, ad traffic flows and all different kinds of stuff. But what they did here was they were sort of looking at different sites that shared fake news or links to fake news, okay, and if they ever also shared links to the fact check. In this case, this is a story about, a fake story about an ISIS leader calling for Muslim voters to support Hillary Clinton. Fake story, it came from a thing called worldnewsdailyreport.com. Okay, hit the next thing. Look at this. This, these, the size of the circle represents kind of how much engagement there was with this story on this site. So people liking it and sharing it and sharing links and stuff like that. And there was only this tiny little bit that's the fact checking share, right? So pretty much everyone is just sort of sharing the fake news, loving the fake news, eating it up, right? And not ever really seeing, if they went to worldnewsdailyreport.com, a link to the fact check that told you that story was wrong, okay? And in the, um, in the broader study, they looked at tons and tons of different stories. And I have to say, like, this, the size of this dot looks big in comparison to some that were on there. I put it, I used this one so that you could actually see it, okay? So pretty much different audiences for those things, right? So kind of living in different <coughs> news spheres, people who kind of see the fake news and people who know that it's fake or are told that it is fake. Okay, so we've got our four things. Now what? Well, <laughs> Just to drive home this point about fact-checking, look at these uh, fake election stories. Again, we got that Pope Francis story. Engagement here, as you can see down here, refers to, again, people who are sharing, who are people who are reacting, like liking, and all that kind of stuff, and making comments on different stories. Now, a site called Ending the Fed was the one that promoted that um, Pope Francis story. That is nearly a million likes, comments, shares, etc. of that story. Wow, that story made the rounds, okay? The next one about WikiLeaks, <laughs> this one happens to be about Hillary Clinton selling bombs to ISIS. I feel compelled to tell you that was fake, even though I would hope you would all know that, but look at that, 789,000 kind of pieces or parts of engagement, yikes. Okay, hit the little thing. The Snopes, I don't, are you guys familiar with the Snopes website? We love Snopes, right? They do a lot of fact checking. They fact checked that Pope Francis story. They got shared 33,000 times. Which if you didn't know that ending the Fed got shared a million times, <laughs> you'd think, oh, 33, good for you, you know? That seems like a tiny, it is, a tiny fraction, really, of people who shared the fact check of that story versus people who just shared the fake story. Okay. Am I depressing everyone? Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to decide if it gets better. So look, this is, this is you, right? So we've got this spectacle going on. Are we just ill-informed? Are we easily swayed? Are we living in a bubble? Are we exhausted? Yes, probably we are, right? And, and it is a spectacle in a way that we want to think about. Right? Like, fake news isn't just like, oh, someone made this story up. There's a lot of, like, just drama and spectacle around it, in a way, that can be quite exhausting, that makes it pretty challenging to be informed, occasionally to be entertained, and so on. Okay? Let's go to the next one. I just wanted to... Oh, really. All right. We're going to talk about, again, this is like the kind of nerdy professor word, but we're going to talk about something called the political economy of fake news. Because what you have seen in those four things, 
right? It's not an either or thing. We have to think about how it's distributed. Thinking about how it's distributed means we have to kind of follow the money and we have to kind of look at um, the different worlds that fake news lives in versus fact checking lives in, okay? So the larger sort of context for all of that, what you already kind of know or might suspect based on the four things we just talked about is that fake news is really cheap to produce. All you need is an imagination and maybe a Google image search, right? So you can stick a picture in there, okay? It's very easy to monetize, which means make money off of it. And it's very easy to disseminate thanks to social networks. You could have your own personal blog, whatever, okay? And when I say cheaper and easier, I mean compared to legitimate news, right? It costs money to have reporters and send them to Iraq, right, to report from there. That costs money, right? So it is not cheap to produce some legitimate news, much legitimate news, okay? It is hard to monetize legitimate news. Why do you think that is? Is it just because people don't want to, you know, they, they don't like the news and so they don't want to pay for it? What isn't really clear to, and why should it be? I mean, this isn't necessarily the, you know, a, the first concern that you would wake up in the morning with, but what might not be clear to a lot of people is how the internet completely undercut the business model for traditional journalism, right? So it used to be the case that you would spend money as a news organization on reporters and equipment to gather news knowing that you could put it in your newspaper or put it on your TV newscast, sell ads around it, and do pretty well. Well, the first thing that happened was that Craigslist happened. Craigslist took all of the classified advertising revenue away from newspapers. It didn't really have any impact on TV because that's not what TV was doing, right? But that was a big chunk of revenue for that typical newspaper was you sort of saying, hey, I found your cat, or please come buy my snowblower, I'm moving to Florida, or whatever, right? All of that gone. Employment advertising, gone with things like monster.com, jobs.com, all that kind of stuff. So people could get that stuff for free. Craigslist and monster and jobs.com, they figured out other ways to make money off of those things. And it's super convenient, you can't blame people. Like it's super convenient, isn't it, to like, go on to one of those sites and find stuff rather than like waiting for the paper and leafing through the paper, right? I get it. But just be aware that that was a big chunk of money that newspapers would no longer have. Well, then, for a lot of reasons that sort of go beyond what we're going to talk about today, um, the way that newspapers kind of went online raised or reinforced an expectation people had that stuff should be free on the internet. So nobody had to pay for news anymore. And other people were sort of aggregating news. And so even if you didn't subscribe to the newspaper, you could still find the news from that newspaper. Well, that's all well and good for you. But if they aren't making money by people coming to the site and looking at the ads they sold, pretty soon you're going to have a situation where, you know, you can't monetize anymore. You can't, like, make enough money to support. So there has been a huge reduction in the number of reporters in this country. You might note that um, in state houses, for example, it used to be that people covered the legislature. There used to be whole teams of report. That's almost zero now across the country, right? So all of these things are relative to kind of traditional uh, news outlets. Okay. Something to think about with Facebook. It's free, right? So who's the product? You are, right? So if there's a way to make money, it's, uh, it's always been off of you, right? But people have this idea like, oh, it's free. That's awesome. It's like, well, you might want to think about your own data a little bit. Okay, next one. And here's the other half of the political. You've got the kind of economy part. Now you've got the political part here. All these things that you've uh, no doubt noticed or sort of talked about. Maybe in this room we have a decreasing level of trust in journalism. Maybe in this room we have some political polarization. We certainly have it in this country. Maybe in this room there are people who don't really trust experts in the way that they used to. But all of these things contribute to an environment in which fake news can thrive, right? You've got a real kind of squelching in some ways of the ability of traditional news to kind of 
be the news, right? And you've got even things like, you know, real journalism kind of not meeting its expectations, really, in some ways, too. Okay, let's go. So, for example, journalism could have performed better. <laughs> I'm just going to stake that out as my position. Wow, they could have really performed better covering that campaign. They never covered issues. I think that study you know, demonstrates what we all probably knew ourselves. Okay, next. Yes, CNN treats politics like sports. That's why you have a la ESPN. If any of you watch ESPN, you know that part of what's on ESPN is a bunch of people shouting over like who had the, okay, I'm kind of not a sports fan, but you know, who had the best like play of the day or whatever. Like, or who should be traded where, but they're yelling at each other. It's entertaining. There's a lot of drama, right? Well, CNN treats politics like that. That's probably not right, okay? So there might be reasons, again, that people are sort of getting fed up. Okay, next. Then we have the chairman of CBS saying, you can just imagine him doing this as the ad dollars are rolling in during the election, right? All these politicians, all these campaigns are buying up ads. And he says... He said this, okay? He didn't deny saying it. This is not fake news, okay? It may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. Wow, thanks, Les Moonves, for nothing, right? Look at what he's saying here. Most of these ads aren't about the issues. They're sort of like the debates, he says, <laughs> okay, which is a sad commentary on the debates as well, okay? Who would have expected the ride we're all having now? The money's rolling in. This is is this a person that we want responsible for, like, ensuring an informed citizenry that can make appropriate voting? I don't know. This sounds like a guy who's just happy the ad dollars are rolling in. He doesn't care if the ads are substantive. He doesn't care what the quality of the campaign is. No, it's good for CBS. Okay? I really am depressing everyone, I can tell. Okay, <laughs> next slide. Oh, been there already. <laughs> we could go way back to something like this story. Look at this, this is from 2002, 15 years ago, right? This is the story where Judith Miller, who's kind of an infamous journalist now, <laughs> right, got this whole story wrong about Iraq, right? You might call this fake news in a way. She got totally taken by a source, right? But again, this plays into this idea that like maybe there is a reason people don't necessarily just trust journalism as much as we might want them to. Okay. And in fact, this is a study from last year about trust in journalism. Look, most of the time I trust news, one third. Journalists individually, even less. I don't trust journalists. I trust the news, but not the journalists. I don't really understand how that works, but okay. The media is free from undue political influence. Only 21% agreed with that. Right? Most working journalists will tell you, and maybe if you come to the event next week, here, free ad for the event next week, right? you'll hear from journalists talking about like, wow, that is so hurtful to us because we try so very hard to be fair right, in how we're treating everyone, impartial. Right? And then look at this, the media is free from undue business influence. Even fewer people agree with that. So we have a problem here, right, to, you know, to the, at the risk of understatement. Okay. And then let's think about this death of expertise idea. How many people, do you guys have friends who graduated from the University of Google? <laughs> they know everything because they Googled it, right? <laughs> this is a problem in our country, okay? And I think the Pizzagate story is kind of a good example because what you had is a bunch of people on a Reddit forum. I don't know how many of you have been on Reddit. <laughs> I have my own personal opinion about that. Don't go, okay, but... <laughs> There's a bunch of people on this Reddit forum who were like convinced in sort of being expert investigators, right, of all the kind of symbology and all these like clues about whether or not this pizza restaurant was like secretly, you know, harboring a child prostitution ring or something. Like, okay, let me just say, 100, 1,000% 1, fake, right? But you had a bunch of people who were uh, completely ignoring any sort of expert anything about this, right? They thought them, they've sort of made themselves the experts. So, wow, okay, now I'm depressed. Okay, and I do this for a living. <laughs> We've even got in, you know, medicine and science, fabrication, 
of research studies that people are becoming aware of. The, wow, that's undercutting our trust in other institutions and society too. So journalism's not alone. Like pretty much decline of trust is true across all institutions. Politics, journalism, education, I think even, uh, science, medicine, like people, so no wonder people sort of fancy themselves experts because they just don't trust anybody else anymore. Okay, that's, it's sad, okay. <laughs> don't you like how I have to tell you it's sad? Of course you know it's sad. All right. These I found just right before I came here, so if they feel sort of stuck in here, that's probably why, but I wanted to share them with you. So this is a uh, couple of guys at Stanford who did this. They were trying to kind of get at the fake news phenomenon, like by where people got their news. And notice that like almost 49% of people visiting like top news sites, so what they would call in their study kind of real news, legitimate news, went there directly, okay? So they sought out, like, I am going to go to WashingtonPost.com, right? But look here, for fake news sites, 42% of people, they go there, right? Social media. They get to fake news via social media. So we have to, again, think about how our social media environment and all of the kinds of ways that that kind of tinkers with um, how we think about credibility and how we think about the people who are sharing news with us and why those stories sort of appear kind of in the Facebook news feed and, and the top stories and all that kind of stuff. Like, there's a lot going on here that to be concerned about, particularly because social media is really implicated as the gateway to fake news. Okay, next. And then finally, this was, they asked people about the most important source of their election news, and a whole bunch of them said social media. So there's cause for some concern there. Okay. So, we've got all of our economic stuff. We've got kind of our political stuff. And so here's our key question. It's a long question. <laughs> <laughs> to be a key question, really it needs to be, no. How can real news on this eroding kind of possibility of actually making money, that's the eroding resource base, cover highly partisan politics, reach more people, connect communities that are polarized, how we're expecting a lot. And we are now expecting a lot of an institution that maybe hasn't rewarded our trust as much as we would hope it has, and that has very little money, relatively speaking, to what it had in the past to actually cover real stories. We're expecting a lot from real news in this battle against fake news. Okay. So what can we do? Yay, she's gonna talk about things we can do. Will we feel better about ourselves? Let's find out. Okay. Well, we can stop aiding and abetting fake news. Now, I should have had somebody count how many times I say fake news during this talk. Because what I'm starting to think is that by using that term, we are making it a real thing. We are saying, we are calling it out and saying there's something newsworthy about it. We called it fake news. Like, it's a fake. Maybe we should stop doing that. Right? Labels sort of matter. Maybe we should call it what it is. Look at this made-up story, right? Look at this totally false thing, right? We can call it what it is. Look at this piece of propaganda. Look at this misinformation. Look at this error. Why do we have to like lump it all under fake news, right? The label might actually matter. Okay. <coughs> now, you know, some self-reflection. So I don't know if this is gonna make you feel better or not. If anyone's been feeling guilty during the talk, I apologize. I'm talking here about bursting our filter bubbles. Have you guys heard this term, filter bubble? Anyone? Ah, yeah, some of you have. Okay. So filter bubble is this idea, when I was talking about lenses before, the lenses through which we look at stuff that are shaped by our politics and our education and our interests and our family and all kinds of stuff, right? In general, but in social media in particular, we live in kind of a bubble, right? Your friends think like you. That's why they're your friends, right? and they like you. Like, I mean, I'm gonna guess some of you have friends who don't like share 100% of your views on every topic, but in general, you know, people sort of like, you know, birds of a feather flock together. That's essentially the filter bubble idea. Well, the problem is that like fake news on Facebook loves that, right? Because it knows like, oh, hey, I've identified this person who likes to read a bunch of, you know, occupydemocrats.com or whatever that site is, right? And I can kind of, know in that world that all this kind of liberal fake news could circulate, right? 
I live in this bubble and people don't necessarily, they see all their friends sharing it, right? It starts to kind of give you like this false idea about what's true and what's not or like what people know, right? So we need to get out of our own filter bubbles, right? We need to vary our sources. I'm as guilty of this as anyone. Like after the election, I have to say, you know, wow, you know, journalists kind of got a lot of stories wrong. And, you know, that's something we can talk about with journalism, but... I think it's also the case that I was not as broad as I should have been in what I was reading, right? Maybe if I had read more than just the national newspapers, right, I might have been more informed. Like, maybe I should have read some papers from, I don't know, like Arizona or something. Like, I don't, I can get it all online and for free, unfortunately. <laughs> Subscribe to a paper, okay. Um, but the, the key here and kind of bursting your filter bubble, getting outside of your comfort zone a little is that Stop and think for a second. If you're reading something that really gets you riled up, ask yourself, why am I still riled up? Well, fake news works by riling you up, right? And so you might want to just stop for a second. I, am I worked up over something that is real or not? Maybe I need to go find out. Maybe I need to check some other sources. Is this the only source of this story? Is this the only person telling me about Pope Francis? And if it is, why is it a site called Ending the Fed? What does that have to do with Pope Francis endorsing Trump? Like, just stop and think, right? Read beyond the headlines, think before sharing. These are easy things to do, right? Okay. Maybe it's a good idea to push platforms and advertisers and stuff like that to kind of stop this stream of funding through those ad networks. This is something Google and Facebook are kind of working on they're in a tricky position. There are ways to do it. There are ways that you kind of don't want them to do it. There's kind of a lot going on there. But I think that as citizens, you can sort of say like, wow, I really don't want to like support a site that is funded by this crappy fake stuff. I don't, I don't want to do that. Stop doing it, okay? Consumer power, right? And then we can start supporting quality news. I say this as a former journalist <laughs> to you. We can do that with our attention, right? Even better if we do it with our dollars, okay? But at least if we go to actual legitimate sites, they're getting, you know, you're getting counted in kind of how their advertising impressions work and all that kind of stuff, okay. And then maybe we wanna just sort of stop for a minute and not like turn ourselves into experts on everything like, wow, I know everything about vaccines. I can't remember the last science class I took. High school, maybe. I took physics pass fail, like I don't, I don't know, I don't remember the homework. Anyway, right, so maybe we need to just sort of decide, and maybe we just have to do it as baby steps. We just have to decide that we're gonna believe someone until they prove to us that they're not worthy. Of, maybe we just need to like kind of go out on a limb and start retrusting some sources, some experts, some acknowledged like people who study stuff and know stuff. Okay. And let's try not to panic, right? Let's not just assume that every time someone reads a fake news story, they believe it, because you've read fake news stories and have not believed them. Okay, so no panicking. And we don't know yet, like, what the effects are. Like, do they last? How long do they last? Right? Did, uh, did people carry all this fake news into the voting booth with them? I, I don't think we can make that kind of a broad statement, right? So no need to panic, even though we're kind of depressed now. No need to panic. And, oh, I realize I'm running out of time. Okay. <laughs> you were supposed to do the, yeah. <laughs> Back to this idea about news literacy that I also study. There are things that we know about people becoming more news literate. And by news literate, I mean aware of the very things that we're talking about in here. Right? Aware of how the media system works. How the news media system works. How it's funded. Right? Who's doing the writing? What are the kind of standards that they're following? Like knowing those kinds of things, being literate in not just kind of the media, like, oh, I know people can Photoshop stuff. I mean, that's good to know, right? But being especially literate about how the news works, right, can have some pretty powerful impacts. A study that I just got done doing showed that that knowledge people who knew about the structure of the news media system in this country, you know, that's commercial, it has to make money, all these things, were less likely to endorse conspiracy theories. That seems good. <laughs> Maybe I'm just promoting my own study, but I think that seems good, right? 
Although I do like the tinfoil hat guy. Okay, <laughs> next one. Here are other things that we know about people with greater news literacy. They are mo more motivated to consume news, <coughs> okay? And they are more skeptical. We like skeptical. We don't like cynical so much, but skeptical is good. And then look at this third point. It isn't that news literate people consume more news than non-literate people or less literate people. It's probably that they're making better choices, right? They are more news literate and that drives them to better information sources. This is something that we're trying to kind of get at in a more specific way in, in other research. Greater news literacy means greater knowledge of current events, more political activism, but also sadly lower trust in politics. So there is a place where we can kind of fall off the skepticism plateau into cynicism and that needs to be addressed uh, in this research too. But there's reason to think that just knowing, like you guys have now informed yourself more about kind of how the news media system works, especially as it pertains to fake news. <coughs> so now you are, more, you are more able to kind of take those tools into your next exposure to media, so to speak, and say, huh, wow, I feel really um, angry reading this thing. Let's stop, what's the source? Oh, okay, well, does anybody else have this story? Let me Google it, right? Easy stuff. Just takes a second. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So we need both of these things for news literacy. We need both this idea about like looking at the all capital letters and the tons of exclamation points that seem to sort of mark out fake news stories sometimes. We saw some of that in some of the examples. And we also need to address that political economy stuff uh, that we talked about. Okay. And then this, because the resolution isn't so good, this was someone's attempt to kind of map sources according to kind of legitimacy. Um, you can kind of look this up, but you'll see that kind of in the middle here are things like the Associated Press and Reuters and NPR and stuff like that. And then you get kind of, um, there's conservative and liberal sites that are also not, you know, terribly off the mark in terms of the middle. And then there's some that's like, oh, just avoid these entirely kind of thing. Anyway, it's hard to, the resolution makes this maybe not quite as helpful. And then we do have at least some um, advertising people, interactive, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, that's these people who are really committed, they say, to fighting fake news in terms of that, this ad support question. Okay. Ah. Look, it's our ecosystem. So my last question you know, from the list that we started with was, you know, whose responsibility is it and what can we do about it? Well, it's everyone's responsibility. And so maybe it's helpful to think about, you know, the news environment as an ecosystem. And what are we doing to pollute it? By sharing stuff that we know is crap or have not bothered to check, right? And what are we doing to improve it, right? By kind of putting some good stuff in there that the fish can feed off of, right? And the deer can do whatever the deer is doing, right? right? Everyone's responsibility. I don't know if this made you any less depressed <laughs> in the conclusion, but at least you get a pretty picture at the end, and I think that is the end. Is it not? Yes, it is. Yes, sir. Is this PowerPoint going to be uh, Posted online as a click through so we can see these graphics a little closer. Well, I know it's part of the video that they just created. The, the video will not show those any better than worse than what we oh. just saw. <laughs> I can make that available. Okay, actually, actually uh, that's not true because this time the uh, PowerPoint was right in the computer that was being separate from the so recording of what it. you were seeing okay. on the and line. If it doesn't work, then contact her. Yeah, okay. it, should, it should work for you this time because we did it a different way. Yes? How do you, uh, okay, so you get a, something, uh, DuPont polluted Lake Erie, let's just say. And you're gonna, you're gonna try to get the information to the EPA. Okay, they, they're defunding the EPA and I mean, everything else, and they're, they're low staffed. Where do you go? Yeah, well, great question, because um, there is a lot of concern about, you know, public records that people, you know, especially with some expertise, might want to consult on their own, right, to look at. Uh, my only 
you, I bet you could have thought of this, but my recommendation is to start looking for sites, and there are some really good ones. There's one called Inside Climate News, for example, and it's obviously about climate stuff, that there are organizations where they are devoted to kind of specific topics. It's not like a broad thing like going to CNN.com where they've got stories about everything, but they're like in a particular beat or topic area, and they've got some depth of expertise there, and even though they can't get the, you know, if the report isn't there, nobody can have it, but they have access, I think, to other kinds of experts, you know, and they're doing a lot of translating academic research um, for people who don't really care to, like, have to take an advanced course in statistics to understand what they're talking about. They're doing a lot of that kind of work, too. Um, and so there are some, like I said, there are some sites that, you know, for environmental issues, I think you can find stuff. I think there's some stuff in, um, specific political issues like campaign finance reform. There are some people who are kind of expert in that. There's other public health issues that you've got kind of foundation supported um, kinds of work going on there with, like I said, a lot of translation and kind of experts of their own to do that. Okay, second part of that. Now we have a president who tweets. Yes. All right. Sometimes he tweets really bad stuff. Let's put it that way. Let's be nice here. Uh, and. So CNN picks it up, MSNBC picks it up, New York Times picks it up, okay? Obama wiretapped the Trump Tower, you know, or something. So where do you go? You, I mean, they all have it. Yeah. Um, so my answer to that is slightly different. When I said at the end, than the answer I gave you before. When I said at the end that, you know, this is everyone's responsibility, I'm including journalists in that too. I mean, yeah, we all have a responsibility to be better news consumers than we're being, okay? I'm not pointing at anyone in particular. <laughs> I just say in general, we could all do better with that. But journalists also need to do better. And it is my view, and maybe only my view, but it is my view that reporting on every tweet by the president is not responsible reporting, right? And the fact that it's just all of them doing it just makes it worse, right? Because that is that is filling our ecosystem with a bunch of stuff that, like, what do you do with that, right? Especially when they de they also often, if the president tweets that something is fake news, they will then write, you know, it's sort of like that, I don't know how many Harry Potter fans there are in here, but I'm sort of thinking about fake news as like Voldemort, like, don't name it. You know what I mean? Like, but you've got all these news organizations saying fake news because the president said fake news. Well. I don't know that that needs to be repeated. I think you can characterize what the president said without using that term if you feel that you must, right? You could say the president asserted this falsely if it was false or asserted this and it's being investigated or whatever. Um, but I think that what you're describing to me does not sound like responsible journalism. It does seem like, especially with that one, the news media has started to say without any proof yeah. They've started to qualify and call a lie a lie, which they weren't at first. They were not. And, it, and it's, it's both good news and bad news that they weren't initially because of that earlier thing where we saw that trust graph, you know, where people thought that, um, that most people seemed to think that the politics had kind of an undue influence <coughs> on journalists. You know, so journalists are trying really hard to not, like, say someone's a liar because that seems very politically charged. And so they've had to kind of go through a lot of like rethinking their professional kinds of ethics here to say like, well, we're not going to call them a liar, but we are going to say whether there's evidence or not, or whether it's been proven or established one way or the other, right? Because that's still, in the political realm, quite tricky for journalists to deal with. Now, there are other people who say, oh my God, journalists, get over yourselves already. Just say it, right? But there, I think we might want to appreciate their attempt to be a little more kind of bland about it, right? Um, lying, to call something a lie really has to, I think you would have to know what's in someone's mind in terms of intent, and that's not well, always quite obvious. The journalism has fallen down is in false equivalencies. Yes. And I oh, you, you, I am now your biggest fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Starting to that's see my that thing. That has been detrimental. Yeah, the false equivalence, I mean, there, there are, we could have a whole other session on the failures of 2016 campaign reporting. I mean, you saw just sort of a flavor here. And, you know, Les Moonves, like, all excited about how much ad thing, right? There was a ton of disproportionate kind of coverage of certain kinds of events in Canada. I mean, there were just problems kind of all over the place. I don't think the public was very well served 
in the last election. And some of those are quite old problems, right? Just like fake news isn't new, those problems are not new. And every four years, you know, we have like the, the autopsy, right, of the press coverage. And every four years it's like, well, we've got to stop treating it like a horse race. And then what happens four years later? They treat it like a horse race, mm -hmm. right? I don't know what it's going to take to change it, right? I wish I knew. Yeah. So I, um, I'm a little confused about how the ad networks work. Um, yeah, I'm you and me both. Particularly, if, is it that legitimate news sites, say the New York Times or the Chicago Tribune or something that accept ads, but they're not accepting them themselves, they're just buying it from right. wholesale from Google or something? Right, so which, a site which, like... Which makes me think that the newspaper, the business side of the newspapers have some responsibility about who they, how they accept the advertising, unless maybe they have no choice on the internet stuff. Right, I mean, and this is a discussion in journalism now, like, listen, we have to take some responsibility for this stuff that's just showing up, that is, that is in fact outside of our control. Now, it used to be the case that a news site, a newspaper, they would be very jealously guarding their space because everything that appears on that page is attributable to them. Right, and they didn't want to be responsible for something that they had had no control over creating. And I think their desire and their, frankly, their kind of desperate need in some cases to generate advertising revenue led them to just buy into these networks <laughs> that do place ads. They don't see those ads. They just have a contract for Google to, or, or another ad network to just sort of generate all these ads and place them in kind of fixed sorts of sizes and locations on the site. It's, I agree with you, it is a real problem. I'm not precisely sure of all the mechanisms of how it works because most of these news sites also, the, the legitimate ones, they do sell their own advertising as well. I mean, you can see that when you go there, right? They're selling their own ads, but then they often will have space at the very bottom, for example, for these sorts of things that are all just kind of Google ad kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to follow up on that, when they do the, the numbers for all of that, is there any way they can differentiate between real people and bots? Do they... Are they able to do that? I think the ad networks, when they're selling their services, I think they have some research to demonstrate that one way or the other. Because you're right, if I'm a news site, I want to know, like, are those ad impressions reaching real people or not? And you saw that those two quotes that I had from people who kind of evaluate, you know, sites for ad placement and stuff like that, the only thing they really cared about was, are those real people? That's all they care about. And so those ad networks, it's kind of on them to demonstrate that they've, they've figured out, and I don't know how, but that they've figured out how to filter out the bots. I think they can to some extent. Now, I wouldn't guarantee it, you know, but I don't know. Every now and then I see one of those things, and I think that's kind of intriguing, you know, and I'm about to click, and I'm like, no, don't do it. <laughs> don't go there. Yeah. Uh. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you for coming. This is kind of theological, maybe, um, philosophical question that you don't want to answer. That's great. Okay. And the second one, second part, isn't part of the first one, but it's a question that's been burning inside of me to find an answer to, and I haven't have yet to find it. Um, so the first one goes, do you think cultural um, relativism has had an influence on the surging acceptance of fake news, lacking in absolute truth. Hmm. Um, so I don't know if all, everyone heard the question. It had to do with whether cultural relativism is in part, or at least part of this, this phenomenon that we're seeing with fake news. Is that yes. pretty much your question? Um, I don't, well, I don't know that I have the answer. Um, I think that when you kind of put together um, things like, you know, putting journalism aside for a second, where does that, that so-called death of expertise come from? Like, why is it that people st are starting to disbelieve things that seem to have been established as like real for so long? Like, the, like vaccines, I, I apologize if anyone here is, is gonna disagree, but I'm going to just go out on a limb here and say vaccines are safe and you should get them. Okay. So, but where does that come from? Where, where do people kind of 
all of a sudden sort of turn over this idea that experts know anything, right? I, and I don't know that cultural relativism, relativism really necessarily has to do that, but I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't maybe a kind of component. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on, I don't know if I'm understanding cultural relativism quite as you are. What? The culture to me, basically. Your, your truth is your truth. I have a uh, yeah. truth. It's, they're both accepted. You go your way, I'll go my way. Right. Each individual truth. You know, I have a, 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 there's a, a doctoral student um, in our in our college now, who has this really interesting research idea, and you know I, I I'm going to probably butcher it in trying to tell you what it is, but the the gist of it is this: she wants to examine how people sort of unwittingly, really unconsciously, kind of believe themselves to have knowledge that is actually the knowledge of a device, right? So in other, it's sort of like the Google University thing, but a more unconscious kind of process. So she wants to kind of get at whether people just sort of think of themselves as smarter simply because they've had now just complete access to all things that anyone has ever known, every book ever written, every paper, right? And there, I know that sounds sort of crazy, but there's this interesting kind of cognitive psychology thing and sort of tech studies kind of thing that she's doing, really bright student. Now, she's a long time away from coming up with an answer to that question, but it does kind of make you think, like, is the kind of easy access to information, is there like a downside to it in that you just sort of think like, oh, well, I found it, you know, look at this real paper about vaccines appears alongside this completely made up thing from some celebrity, right? And I get to decide what I think is real. And maybe the mere availability of stuff has this like, it's a double-edged sword thing. I don't know. That would be my guess. I probably, now I hear him, I'm being recorded guessing about things. I, <laughs> yikes, people of <coughs> the internet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, your second question. Yeah. If you were, you're so kind. I, I forgot it already. I, I almost did. I wrote it. <laughs> um, it's how could how could all these known polls who had you know had the their metrics you know and how they their, how they do their polling is mathematically derived? How could all of them have missed this selection? All of them. You know, I'm talking about like the top. 20. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I'm wishing I had the answer to that because if I did, I would be really rich right now. Um, part of it, so there's a couple of things, and again, this is outside, a little bit outside my area of expertise. Here I'm kind of acting like I'm, so full disclosure, I am not a polling expert. But here's what I'm sort of reading and, and from experts, okay? One, when you looked at a lot of those polls, um, the Trump win was actually, or the, or the results for Clinton and Trump, I guess I should say, were actually within the margin of error, right? And so there's some of that. And it just so happened, I mean, this is statistics. It just so happened, in this case, right, that it, first of all, it was close enough, right? And I think this gentleman in front of you actually knows something about the margin of error <laughs> that he's going to tell, right? But so the polls aren't necessarily wrong because those results weren't completely out of bounds of, of the the, oh, what do you call that, confidence interval of the poll, right? So the feeling, though, that people have is that polling ultimately failed them. So whether or not, like, technically those results were within the margin of error, there's a feeling that, like, wow, they all seem to be point the same way. How can that be? And that, that's a whole other kind of question. There's also some problems with, um, and it's becoming, it has been a problem, and it continues to be a problem that, polling that relies on calling people on the telephone, you know, they are trying to, you know, everyone's got caller ID on their cell phone, they're not, it's, the sampling is really a big problem. And so people are having to kind of come up with new ways to project from those samples. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. One observation. Polling indicated who won the popular vote, did it not? It did. There is that. Yeah, and there is that. Yeah, because Polls ask people how they're going to vote. Polls did predict the vote outcome. What happens in the Electoral College, which does in fact actually select the president, doesn't correspond with the popular vote. Who 
Who's got a less depressing question? No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, yes, sir. This problem of fakeness and fake expert and so forth. I have like probably about eighty-five percent of it because I don't own a computer, and what's even more blasphemous, I don't want one. <laughs> but how do the like in the schools, starting in second grade, third grade, whatever our students are exposed to computers, are they exposed to this expert? fakeness and this fakeness and if not how is that eradicated from the system starting from third grade up or whatever it is well you'll be happy to know that at least the the school districts that i know about that have you know computers available for kids there are tons of like devices and filters on those computers that don't let them search certain things on it like it, it very much curtails what you can find on the internet to things that are appropriate for kids and so there's pretty much zero chance that a kid could inadvertently get on, say, a porn site or these fake news sites that, you know what I mean? Like, it's limiting the domains that can be searched. Often, like with the younger kids, you really can only search like five different places or, you know what I mean? It's very circumscribed. Okay, so, hire those people then to, uh, yeah. <laughs> for the news media. Well, I mean, the, the, the issue there is that you don't, I mean, I. I should speak for myself. One doesn't, I don't really want necessarily Facebook or Google to be in the business of censoring either by limiting, you know, the ability of people to just put stuff out there, right? What I want is just for everyone to be smart. You're smart, right? And know kind of what they're looking at and sort of still retain that like, hey, you know, the best antidote to bad speech is more speech. That's kind of my general thinking. Yes, sir. You spoke about uh, news media uh, covering more of the horse race than the issues. Uh, I, you know, I think we all expect more of PBS and NPR. Mm -hmm. They pretty much fell down on that count too, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I would put them in the same category no. as like cable news, for right. example. Um, they also could have done better. I mean, I think that even the kind of non-commercial media that you're describing probably did too much polling and horse race. I put, kind of put the polling and horse race reporting kind of together because it's all about who's ahead, who's ahead, yeah. you know, kind of thing. And I think that they looked at that a lot too. I mean, now, granted, I was a journalist a long time ago, and I don't mean to just sort of, you know, beat up on journalists here. I'm going to guess that being a journalist covering this campaign was incredibly difficult simply because everything that you thought you could count on wasn't happening. Right, like you really didn't have a, have a way to kind of grasp what was going on. This this candidate kind of comes out of nowhere, right? It, it, it violates all the political norms of his party and of you know just what it means to run for president. Like there was, it was hard, I think, to kind of not get swept up in the oddness of it, you know, relative to other campaigns. And so I'm not excusing the behavior. I mean, but I am sort of explaining why they might have been behind, you know, in kind of seeing what was going on. That it by no means excuses horse race coverage though, because we've known that's a problem forever. Yeah. So yes sir. One thing about the current president tweeting uh, instead of having news conferences in the old days, uh, up till now, uh, he'd be up the president would be speaking in front of a live audience of reporters and they would just question the heck out of him. Yep. And he has no uh, buddy to, you know, like, he just cuts that out, you know, he doesn't, no negative stuff that he doesn't like is, is, is questioned of him. Right. It's a, it's a challenge that Washington reporters haven't really faced um, in terms of access to a president, because in some ways he's quite accessible in that he tells you what's on his mind via tweet, but in other ways he's quite inaccessible to that sort of back and forth you know, respond to the question kind of thing. He's, he appears much more in much more controlled kinds of settings or rallies and things like that where he's kind of in control of the narrative. And that, it does make it hard um, for what, but you know, I, who said Washington reporter's job should be easy, right? Like, they should be up to the task. But yeah, it is a, it is a very different environment, I agree. Yeah. I'm just wondering, are journalism classes at the university now becoming polarized? everything that's going on there. I mean, I hear that, you know. You mean politically? Politically, yeah. yeah. Um, I personally haven't noticed that. I, the courses that I teach, as you might guess from this, I'm not really, it's been a long time since I was a reporter, so I'm not the one teaching reporting. 
or editing and things like that. I'm teaching more about the history of journalism and the ethics of journalism and things like that. I have to say, I haven't really noticed um, students having a hard time talking to each other or, um, or sort of acting in ways that you know, might reflect polarization, whatever that might be. I'm just trying to think of what an example would be. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean there hasn't been some discontent. Now, on the university campus in general, there have been quite a lot. You know, there are supporters of both Trump and, well, formerly, you know, candidate Clinton on campus. And I think, you know, there were some uncomfortable moments. But in the classroom, I haven't really noticed it personally, I've thankfully. Kind of, I've been kind of wondering the same thing, in, you know, in the last, like, 10 years. Has your journalism group become more of people wanting to be pretty talking heads? And all of a sudden, maybe now they're realizing they want to get back to actual you know, investigative journalism. Is that starting to appear? Well, I, yeah, so the good news um, is that we do have more people sort of coming at journalism, not tons yet, but more, kind of coming at journalism from sort of a data perspective. Like, I'm going to investigate stuff. I'm going to like take advantage of all these tools to really get at big data, you know, what can that tell us about different phenomena, like to kind of do that sort of investigative reporting. I mean, there are still, there always will be, and again, I realize I'm saying this on a recorded thing, there will always be students who sort of come to journalism because they just kind of want to be on television, mm -hmm. but that's not by any means all or even most of them, right? There really are people who want to report what's going on in their community or use kind of new tools, whether that's kind of multimedia things or data analytics and stuff like that to do innovative kinds of reporting. And more and more, they are going to need to have those different kinds of skills because traditional news jobs aren't like growing. They're going to be creating their own jobs or they're going to be going to kind of innovative sites. Or I have a former student who works for LinkedIn. Now think about that. She's a journalist and she works for LinkedIn. Well, LinkedIn actually does like some journalism. Within their website, it's all about kind of professional development and business and stuff like that. You know, yeah, she's not like the next Woodward or Bernstein at LinkedIn, but that's kind of a different way of thinking about where you can do journalism and what sort of skills and so on. So, there's a it's a it's a quite a variety. Yeah. I had a speaker make a comment, and I want your opinion. The comment was, "The more educated you get, the more liberal you become." Do you find this out with your students? There are studies of that over people's lifespans. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know, because we have students, you know, I see students in a four-year span of their lives. And so, and I don't necessarily see them from, like, the day they arrive on campus to graduation day. You know, I don't, so I don't really know. But there is um, research, I think, done by sociologists and maybe some political scientists, too, that do kind of demonstrate that as that there's a correlation, right, between having additional years of education and your political preference. It's not perfect, it's not causal, right? It's a correlation, but um, that has been demonstrated in, in some research, yeah. Is that a self-perpetuating thing? In other words, somebody started it, and as a result of teaching the higher, you know, in postgraduate work, they became more liberal, and they, those became teachers, and they became more liberal, and it just, it just feeds on itself. Well, I, I mean, I can understand why that might occur to you as, as an explanation, and I'm not denying that it might be a contributor, but I think you also, there are other, I don't, again, I'm not an expert here on this particular thing, and, but I, and I'm trying to recall these studies that I've seen, and I want to say that they looked at kind of not just like party identification, you know, or, or re people reporting that they are conservative or liberal, but kind of what other factors might be part of that. So, yeah, I apologize. I just don't know enough about the, the details of that research to be explicit. But I think that there are other things about the educational experience beyond just what a teacher tells you in a classroom. That, so, for example, I teach journalism history, right? How, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to, if I, if I wanted to, and trust me, I don't, okay? But if I wanted to, I don't know what I can do with journalism history that's going to inculcate any particular kind of political view. Like, the histories that, you know, it's like I'm going to talk about Pulitzer and Hearst regardless, 
right? I'm going to talk about certain. So I think there are other things about getting extra education that don't have anything to do necessarily with what a teacher says in a classroom, but might have to do with the experience of being with people who aren't like you for the first time, like sort of expanding your social networks in ways that maybe wouldn't have happened if you had not gone on to college or, you know what I'm saying? I think those are, but again, I, I don't know the, the details of the research uh, enough to really tell you. Hang on one sec. Oh wait, is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Yes, sir. Uh, I, it's more of a comment. You, you mentioned um, verifying uh, information from multiple sites. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you've got to be careful that they're not just copying each other. So, right. you, you know, when <laughs> I do that, I generally look for word patterns within the, the text and then compare that. And if I see a high correlation, I assume that they've been taken from, they, they're right, one's copied the other or they both copied a third party. And I, and I, and I think if you going to uh, you, you use multiple sites as a discriminator, you, you probably should do that. Mm -hmm. Right, you don't want to just be like, oh look, 10 fake sites said the same thing, yeah, like exactly. it must be true, right. <laughs> yeah. So part of this is starting to develop a habit too of, I, I think this kind of relates to the trust issue, but you know, kind of going out on a limb and saying, okay, I'm going to look at the, well, NPR, NPR.org. Maybe I'm going to like just decide that for a week, I'm going to get my news from NPR. And at the end of the week, do I feel like I got some information? You know what I mean? And so maybe I sort of start with one kind of baseline source that I feel like warrants my trust. And then I can kind of build from there. And so that way, once I've done that, if I see something on some other site, I can say, you know, and it seems like a pretty big story. Like, you know, if Hillary Clinton sold bombs to ISIS, someone's going to have that story, except, yeah. you know, besides <laughs> Joe Schmo's fake news blog, right? Yeah. And so then you could say, like, oh, I saw that. Hmm. Let me go to NPR, the thing I've decided, I'm just using that as an example, that I can trust, and see if they have the story. And if they don't, I might want to pause for a second. Yeah, I, I generally use the, the BBC or NPR. And yeah. Sometimes I'll go to Paris Match and, uh, uh, and, and read that. But the, you know, I, I try to stick to uh, reputable sites to do the, the mm -hmm. verification. Um, now, you, you mentioned the, the false equivalency. I, Isaac Asimov had a statement on that, that, that it puts his, your ignorance on a level with his expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, the, um, the, the, uh, I'm trying to remember the name now of the guy who sort of coined this whole death of expertise idea, too. Oh, I know I can't come up with it. Yeah. Don't even get me started on false equivalence. This is like my new, my new thing. I gotta, I gotta do some more writing about it or something. Get it off my chest. Did you, when you were noting the false equivalence, where did you think was it happening on your trusted news sites? Was it happening on no, BBC? No, it, it happens on all of them, particularly with, with, uh, and to some extent, this is misinformation being deliberately put out. To, um, to, to journalists uh, in terms of uh, uh, the environment and climate change. Um, I, I'm just going to give a disclosure. I, I, I'm a chartered water and environmental manager. I have professional expertise in that field. Um, my professional organization has concluded after a long study that climate change is real and humanly generated. It's also, if you look at uh, websites and news agencies they, they run it like, well, this guy says this and this guy says that. Well, that might be true, but th this guy here represents 99% right. of all peer-reviewed um, papers. Uh, and this guy is Joe Smart that works for the oil company. Uh, and, uh, and that is not a real equivalency. Right. Um, but by the, you know, the oil companies specifically have, have deliberately and maliciously put out false information over a, a very long period and of course it's coming to light that they knew a lot of this stuff right. you know, 20 and 30 years ago and kept it quiet just like the cigarette companies did in the, in the 50s. Right. Uh, and so you know, the, that's where the false equivalency becomes very dangerous and, and the idea that you've got to give equal space to both sides when you know, one side is very, very much a, a minority opinion 
Uh, and the other side has got a lot of peer-reviewed science behind it. Right, and what you're describing is an unfortunate byproduct of something that starts from a good place, right? The desire to offer up multiple perspectives on a topic, right? Mm -hmm. That seems like not a bad thing, necessarily, as kind of a basic guide to practice, to journalistic practice, but the unfortunate byproduct then is, well, when something becomes established, like, you know, are we going to, every time we write about the moon landing, are we going to offer up the notion that some people think that was a hoax? Like, why would we do that, right? That it's been, the moon landing, not a hoax, okay. <laughs> it's been, right, so we don't, we don't do that for so many other things that are just accepted as established, but for some reason we keep doing it with scientific issues like vaccines and climate change. Oh, and it's, it's unclear to me why that persists, this notion that, somehow a naysayer that represents a tiny fraction of the scientific community, like why that gets equal footing. Well, it, it gets equal footing in climate change because our companies put a lot of money in Well, money. There's, then there's that, yeah. We now would hope that journalists It's would more learn. difficult to understand. Yeah. Um, you know, particularly as the, uh, the main scientific paper that was written on vaccination has been withdrawn uh, and the doctor that did it lost his license to practice. Right. Over that. Right. You know, it was over. fabricated, actually. Yeah, he, he told yeah. Me, yeah, it was totally bogus. Right. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he lost his license to practice medicine because of fabricating that report. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Just in the sense of the cycle of the you know, 016 election, I started watching YouTube. And this guy called Alex Jones, and then you know, because somebody introduced me to him, and, and he's real dramatic, and he's like he's dramatic patriotism, you know, like we've got to be patriots to be get, using this information that he has and everything. Now I'm really getting, I don't know, my mind's just kind of like I don't want to watch it no more. Good. But, the, but the thing is, is he like so? Is he? He's not news. He's social media, isn't he? Is he more like this? He has a radio show. And so I think what you're seeing on YouTube, I mean, I think he also live streams maybe the video. Yes, he does. Trump Some, likes him. Yeah. He, um, so here's the thing to know about Alex like, yeah. Jones. I'm going to encourage you to just stop with that already. And here's why. Um, he he's himself. He's got that Pizzagate thing, you know. And yeah, he's big on conspiracy theories. He likes conspiracy theories. And, but here's, a, here's something that is not fake news to know about Alex Jones. He is currently involved in a custody dispute. And during that custody dispute, he has asserted that everything on his show is made up. His lawyer did. Right. His that. lawyer, I think, he saw that he would really have no chance of probably getting custody of his children if they thought that, you know, someone who believed some of the things that he purports to believe <laughs> actually, you know. So there, you would be wise to question what he's doing there. I think it's more in the realm of entertainment. Okay than actual news because those things like Pizzagate and stuff like that, he he's he's sort of spinning a lot of tales. It's overwhelming though, he, it know, is overwhelming. He was looking like the really Yeah. You know, aligned with these pedophiles and all this stuff and you know, it was, it was awful. Yeah. You know. My my other question has to do a little bit different. It's, I get a lot of information from Wikipedia. Is that you know, I mean it's you know, I look up the different companies and stuff. Should I just, how, how do you sift through it that that's true or something? Is this, do you guys need to go look farther, like in so the books Wikipedia's library? So Wikipedia's not or? a bad place to start. I don't think I would end my search for information at Wikipedia, but it's not a bad place to start. And if you go to the bottom of a Wikipedia page on anything, they list their sources of their information, and you can kind of go, you can see what you think of those sources, and then go visit them and kind of get more information that way. But, you know, that's not a bad gateway. I know that, like, a lot of times we, maybe librarians do this too, tell people, like, don't do it, you know. <laughs> but we just mean don't rely on it exclusively, right? But that is, um, that is a resource that you've got a lot of people sort of weighing in and cor trying to correct each, each other, right? So it's kind of an open environment, and that's good. Right, because if someone puts something totally crazy on there, someone is going to say, like, no, 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 and, like, re-edit the page, right? So it's not the final word on anything, but I don't, I personally don't have a problem with people using it as a springboard to maybe, you know, like, okay, I heard about this guy. Who's that guy? I'm going to go to Wikipedia. Like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can go read this other thing about that guy. You know, get closer to kind of the horse's mouth that way. Yeah. But, yeah, I, my 
personal plea to you is no more Alex Jones. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> hard. On, on Wikipedia, there's the talk page, and then there's the history of, of, of transposing of the page that right. uh, can be beneficial when a particular organization or person is keeps trying to edit, and then eventually right. it gets bit out as... Right, that is, that is very interesting because sometimes you see what you're describing, which is people who have a stake in, you know, a particular kind of, motive, like trying to edit the page to reflect that and other people coming in and saying, no, you know, like there's a battle over how and certain things are characterized. It does have that, that banner that it puts up, um, that, that, you know, this might be in down to, uh, you, you know, it will give a, a, a series of, of objections to, to the, you know, to, to the article in some cases. Uh, another disclosure, I, I'm actually a person that writes on Wikipedia. Oh, I've never met a Wikipedia writer. Yeah. Hello. I, 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 uh, on a fairly esoteric topic, the cotton mills of Oldham, Lancashire. Wow. Well, that's where I was born. And, uh, I, I, and so there, there's, some, uh, there's some stuff on, on that page that I wrote. Um, but it, you know, my, my experience of Wikipedia is if you're looking for some technical information, you're, you're like, the cotton mills of Oldham, please go on. <laughs> <laughs> It then um, Wikipedia is very good. You know, if you, if you want to read the chemistry of uh, of some obscure compound, if there's an article on Wikipedia, it's, it's probably going to be true. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to go and read, um, say, the history of Macedonia since 1990, um, then th there's a lot of scope for uh, for, for, for right. being skeptical. Right. Uh, but for for something like uh, you, you know reading. Uh, you know how Calculate came up with the benzene ring type thing. Wikipedia, I, th I think, is pretty solid. Right. But when you get into the political stuff, then it becomes, right. it, it, particularly modern political stuff, it, it becomes a lot less solid be because you get personal uh, preferences in. But for, for very technical and specific stuff, I think Wikipedia is very good. Okay, very kind man was like actually lifting the clock off the wall and showing it to me. So <laughs> I think that means that we're done. Yeah. Thanks for all your questions. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm glad you came. They need to get a hook, you know. Take that. Great. I want to know this is great. Thanks again to all of you for coming. Don't forget our the last part of the series is going to be next week. Yeah, the journalists. Um, in, as the panel discussion, um, so we'll wrap it all up then. And if you can't make it out there, make sure you look for us um, through live stream. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to look at it now. But I'm, what? What? I, is? I fabricated it to, for our talk next week. Wait, you, this is a flyer you made? Yes. Oh, it's not the flyer for the... No. Ah, okay. So Putin tells RT to get all the WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks dumped all the DNC emails. That Russia thing. So how do you figure it out? I think... We can't, right? I don't think individually we can. I think we have to rely on journalists. So you get so CNN reports, oh, this is real, you know, and MSNBC knows, and then you got Fox News. I think eventually we're going to know, but I think people are still investigating. I think BBC it's too soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Hi, We're thanks for your question. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you came. I, I am too, because I really, really, I learned a lot. Oh, good. And, and I wasn't, didn't feel like you were disrespectful. Oh, good. And, um, That's really good. Yes, you were. Thank you. you were excellent. Well, thank you so much. You shake your hand. Oh, I appreciate now, it. Are you at Chicago or? Uh, Champaign-Urbana.